please be in prayer for the Stewart family. We are in the process of uh, going forward with our application to become citizens. So coming uh, Tuesday, we've got to do our biometrics down here in Oklahoma, just uh, opposite where the airport is there. And uh, Seppi's all worried because uh, last time she had her fingerprints done, they couldn't find any. <laughs> so they said to her, you cannot do any more dishes. <laughs> So, so hopefully she's, she's built up some fingerprints now. And so there are all sorts of biometric measurements they've got to make and so on and so forth. And then uh, I think in January, then we've got to have an interview, some sort of a formal interview. And that's going to be interesting, see what happens. You know, uh, last time they just kept at it until they got something they said were adequate. So we don't uh, know what would happen if you if you actually didn't get any if there physically was no fingerprints there? I don't know. Really? Oh, this is the real ID one, is it? Yeah, yeah. Our oh, machines? Yeah. Same problem, yeah. Okay, yeah, because probably everyone does really have some fingerprints in there somewhere. You just need to be much more sensitive to get them out. So be in prayer. That's uh, something which we're doing, and we're looking forward to it. Unfortunately, we're going to miss out on the opportunity to vote. So make sure all you vote for us. <laughs> Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for another time, Lord, to open the Scriptures. And as we look at the Gospel of John and look at the summary, Lord, we ask that we'd be edified, strengthened, and equipped. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So here we are. I think this will probably be our last uh, session we'll have on the summary. Uh, last time we were talking about the adoption, we are Thesea. Um, and we are, we are Thesea ma is made up of two parts. One, Huios, which means son. And Thesea comes from Tithemi, which is to place. To place is a son. And s these are exhaustively the places where you can find adoption. So the word adoption is not really used a whole lot. And so it's kind of significant as you go through these passages to see where they're used. And you'll notice that you've got passages in Romans, and there's one in Galatians, and then in Ephesians. And so you find that we, we in this age, are associated with a particular adoption. And this adoption, of course, means that we have a particular inheritance. And we can see that that adoption brings forth a hope which is completely unforeseen, in ages past. And we know that as part of what we've understood. We see this. But then there's other adoptions, and you'll find that in the book of Acts that there is an adoption which relates to the nation of Israel. Of course, they uh, would be adopted and would, were given a hope as the wife. But then there's also the overcomers that were given the hope as a bride who, going through much suffering, would be given this as a reward. So these things are kind of interesting because they're associated with various Gospels. Uh, there's a Gospel unto salvation, but there's also good news about the inheritance. And we don't want to miss out on understanding these things. Now, as w I went through this, I found all sorts of great things. Uh, just, this is just pointing out the, the great um, schema here where you've got um, C's joining up. To whom pertaineth the adoption? and the promises. You see, adoption and promises meeting together, that the adoption is related to certain promises. Of course, some of these promises, as we have found out, don't relate to what were given to the, to the uh, prophets of old, but rather promises that go right back before the foundation of the world, in our case. So it's kind of interesting to see these kind of uh, structures. And we found that in, in John, he doesn't talk about adoption. There are certainly children Tekna, children, but no, not huioi, not those that have been adopted. And that's kind, of a, that's kind of a big thing. That's something that's striking about this, uh, John's Gospel. And um, so I, I made a few notes here about this, about the uh, fact that you'll find that there is this new Jerusalem, which is mentioned in the book of Acts. When I say the book of Acts, I'm talking about those things that happened during the book of Acts, which includes such epistles as Galatians. And uh, so I've you know, made this little picture here where you've got the elect nation, and there's a peculiar people. Peculiar just means possession, a, a special possession of God. 
And it's interesting that there's the, in respect of the one body, they're also referenced as a peculiar people. So it's interesting that we also are a special people, special possession, right? And then in between here, you've got the elect remnant, the, the bride, the overcomers. So all of those associated with callings and adoptions. And here I just made mention about the way in which the Lord found the possession and the special treasure. And then he hid it in the field and then bought the whole field, bought the world. And uh, that's how we get in, in terms of salvation. Um, okay. Uh, this is just the verses showing you where the peculiar people is mentioned in Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So you can see a peculiar people. And you can see the Greek word here, peris, periousion, laon. La, laos is a people. Okay, it's cool. And then also you find uh, Peter also mentioning in his calling the peculiar people, the nation of Israel for which he was given ministry. And then I, uh, of course, we talked about Matthew 22 and 1 to 6. And this talks about this, this two gatherings that went on that both of them were rejected. Um, so in Matthew 22, 1, it says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Interesting, isn't it? Marriage. Marriage. Now this, is, this comes up in John. Okay? And what you've, got to, what you've got to do is you've got to throw away all of tradition when it comes to this idea of hopes and callings, and who is sent, and who is the apostle. You've got to throw it all out, because I'll tell you what people do. In their effort to somehow make the Bible more literate and understanding, they more or less merge everything together and pretend there's no distinctions. Right? And, and what we are trying to do is understand the Scriptures as they are written, and take seriously... The fact that there are different apostles and there are different callings and there are different ministries. We're going to find that today. One of the big things that's going to come out in this summary today is going to be that very point. And it says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden. Oh, these are cool ones. Now, wait a minute. And sent forth his servants to call them that were called. You see, there are called ones and then... He sent these out to call those that were called. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because that reinforces a lot of what we have come already to understand that there are certain special callings in the Bible. And it says to them, to the wedding, and they would not come. Well, man, that's, that's amazing. They won't come to the wedding. Their guests won't come. No, don't want to come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden, again, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatlings are killed. And all things, here's the statement, all things are ready. On the basis of a sacrifice, all things are ready. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, and now all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Last night we watched, watched uh, Geronimo. <laughs> Uh, Sifi, she likes, she said to me, Wayne, I don't want to watch any modern movies. I just want to watch all these old ones. You know, just let's watch the old Western, John Wayne, and all the rest. That's all we need to watch. So, okay, cool. Yeah, I like that. So, Geronimo. And well, John Wayne wasn't in that one. But nonetheless, it brings out a lot of, how can we say, ideals and ideas that we have lost today. We have lost them. You know? Simple things. Okay, it goes on and says, and the reason why I think of this, and they would not come, because Geronimo, he's pretty basic, he just says, come! <laughs> he comes to his wife, come! <laughs> and if she doesn't come, I carry you! <laughs> anyway, it's kind of funny. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, tell them which have bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen. So this is all this killing, come into the marriage. But they made light of it. They made light of it. Hmm. 
You see, when, it, when this expression comes up, that reminds me uh, of what happens in the book of Hebrews. Same idea comes up there. And went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. That's the result of what happened with those. And then if you read the verse 7 and following, then goes the highways ministry. Now go out into the highways. Right? Cool. And, and let's just look at that because I, th I think we should look at it. Let's have a look at Matthew um, chapter 22. And let's just look at this. I, I think we, we need to... I mean, I assume these things, but I think, think it's wrong to do that. Let's just look down here at verse uh, 7. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. There's what we commonly call A.D. 70. Titus comes in, burns the city up, and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. Okay, not worthy, man. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Bid to the marriage. Okay, so the third ministry now is a continuation of the others, except it's got a different audience. Go out into the highways, and all you find, good or bad, come on in, man. They're going to be guests to the marriage. Same marriage. All right? Very important to see this. Okay? And if, if you, since you're in Matthew there, just, just jump across to John chapter 21. So when you get to John 21, you get this very interesting thing happen. And I know I'm being slightly repetitive, but we need to. We need to dig back into this. So in John 21... And uh, says this in verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. He's talking, the Lord's talking to Peter. Remember, Peter failed big time, three times. And so chapter 21, amongst other things, is all about now reformatting the system. Allowing you to now see what happened to Peter. And furthermore, what, what the Lord thought of Peter and his prophecy concerning Peter, which was that he would die in old age and he would be a servant. He would die this great death. He says in verse 19, This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Okay, so Peter, he definitely has a ministry. And this ministry relates back to that Matthew 22, 1 through 6. He's finding himself into the second part of that ministry. That's what he's doing there. And he goes on and he says, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following. Now we know who this is. Look at verse 24. This is the disciple which testify of these things. See that? We know who this is. This is John. And he goes on, which also leaned on his breast, verse 20, at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Okay, so this is talking about the, that last supper that occurred and how John had his head on the Lord's bosom and asked this question. Then verse 21, Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Now it's quite clear that Peter now had been firmly engrafted in his ministry and what he should do. Right? Which relates to that second part of Matthew 22, 1 through 6. Right? Before the Lord sent his armies and destroyed Jerusalem. Before then, Peter had his ministry. It's all clear. He's got it. Follow me, man. Do it. Okay. And then Peter says, Lord, and what shall this man do? <laughs> it's kind of strange the way this comes out now the way this is answered and I think I've got a slide on this okay this is the part that I want to emphasize so here's the slide we've just read this what shall this man do and now look at verse 22 see it in your own Bible Jesus saith unto him if I will if I will that he tarry that he remain Till I come, 
What is that to thee? Again, he says, follow thou me. Now, there's a number of things that comes up. Now, I put in red here that there's a false notion about John not dying, etc., etc., and, and, and John clears that up. Okay, and you can read about that. But it's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make here is twofold. First of all, let's not worry about this, I will tarry. Let's look at this last part. What is that to thee? What does that mean? If someone says to you, what's that to thee? What does that mean? None of your beeswax. Right? Essentially, that's the, what the Lord is saying to Peter. Peter is saying, and hey, what shall this man do? What shall John do? What shall John do? None of your beeswax. Right? None of your beeswax. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? In other words, when Peter says, what shall this man do? The Lord understood what he meant and says, if I will that he tarry till I come. In other words, if it's my will that he has a ministry till I come, that's none of your beeswax, none of your business. None of your business. That seems kind of strong. But there's a principle that's coming up here, which I think is really worthwhile thinking about. And you'll notice I've entitled this, None of Your Business. A lot of people want to get involved with other people's business, don't they? <laughs> you got, <laughs> yeah, and they get, they get themselves and other people in a lot of trouble. Now, this principle, though, has big, big, big ramifications in the Scriptures. Look at this one in Romans 15, 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Now think about what Paul is saying here. He's not saying, now everybody here has got to listen to what I have to say. Because if he did, he would destroy the other person's foundation if that other foundation was you know, wrong. In other words, he's authenticating the fact that it's quite possible that another man could have a legitimate foundation to do with Christ. But that's not the foundation he's building. Paul's building. He says, where Christ was named. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Mm. Now this word here, see this here, is very strong. And it's this uh, adjective, elotrios. Themilion is this uh, foundation. And this elotrios, what it means is, many times it means like an alien or an enemy can even be used. Now, it's not always meaning enemy. It just means not of oneself, someone else. Another person's foundation. And it comes up in a very interesting place. And I've given every place where you can find it in the Scriptures, but I want you to find this one place. Certainly here in Romans 15, 20. Go across to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 15. Look at this, man. Oh, man. You've got to read all of chapter 10. Chapter 10 is all about don't look upon other people's things and what they're doing. Look, put, put your eyes on Christ. And there's a whole lot of general things uh, about this that he brings up in 2 Corinthians 10. But I want you to know, notice how he moves this. And he says this in chapter 10 and verse... Um, uh, well, let's start from verse 12. I think it's a good place to start. Uh, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring... Now, notice this word comes up, measure. Measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Very unwise to do this. But we will not boast of things without our measure. We will not boast of things without, that goes outside of our measure. That implies a measure has been given. A measure has been given to Paul. As a measure has been given to Peter. As a measure has been given to John. And we need to respect those measures. 
You, you get the point I'm coming to? Now, what people do in the Bible is they do this. You know, they try and mold everything together and make just one thing. Whereas what we've got to do is accept the measure that's given to each person. Now, look what it says. And it says, um, verse 13, but we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. Notice it says, um, uh, but according to the measure of the rule, a measure of the royal rule. Now that word rule is very interesting because it, it comes up um, in this whole idea of a canon. You've probably heard of the word canon in that context, the canon of Scripture. That's the rule, right? The rule of Scripture. And we usually use it quite loosely. The canon is all of the, those books which have been assembled, which make part up the, of the corpus of, of the Word of God, right? The corpus of the Word of God. We call it the canon. <clears throat> now, you can see here in verse 16, it says, it says this, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things. Hmm. There's the elotrios coming up here. Boast in another man's line of things. That means in another man's canon. We don't boast in another man's canon. I've got my own measure that comes from the canon that's given to me. I'm not going to boast in some other man's canon. Then, friends, we better be careful about what canon we're going to. What rule? Don't, don't you think this is cool? <laughs> Have you seen this before? And seen it in this particular context? I, I think this is, this is incredible. I have not seen this majored on by any writers that I've read. And I've read a lot from dispensational writers. I don't see this. It's not brought out. And yet it's a very strong thing. And it comes up in all places right there at the end of John's Gospel where Peter says, And what shall this man do? And the Lord hits him hard. None of your beeswax. You do what I told you to do. You see what I'm saying? It's pretty amazing. And you keep on reading this thing down. It says in verse um, uh, 17, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Okay, so the Lord has got his job of giving us scriptures that are supposed to be rightly divided. And we need to get the canon that's ours. Huh? I think it's pretty cool and clear stuff here. You need to read it though. Now, if you look at 2 Peter 3.15, here's another passage, which is another thing to do with ministries that need to be distinguished. None of your business, right? That idea. An account of the long sufferings of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. And he recognizes the wisdom that was distinct and, and separate and given to Paul, and he's acknowledging this idea, right? Distinctions. He's observing the distinctions. He's, he's recognizing that wisdom that was given to Paul. And he writes to the Hebrews, right? And that's interesting. Now in Galatians, now here comes, here comes some, some stuff here, friends. <laughs> There's some stuff coming in now. Now you've got to put it together. Because in Galatians 2, verse 7, that we read, it says, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, okay, we understand that. We, re we just read in John about how the Lord said, Follow me. And he told them, Feed my lamb, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. As the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, verse 8, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Now wait. Look at verse 9. <sighs> Very carefully. And when James, okay, 
Jacob, Cephas, the little stone, Peter, and who? John, John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, that's Paul, they gave to me, Paul, and Barnabas, the right hands of fellowship, agreeing with this, agreeing with this, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circum... Two things, of course. One is, they acknowledge the distinctions. Secondly, we see their distinctiveness too. We see that James, Cephas, and John, they were to go to the circumcision. Okay? So, they were to go to the circumcision. At some place back here, they're going to the circumcision. But we know from Matthew 22... And from John's Gospel, we know that at some stage, which I'll loosely call AD 70, this is the record of when Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed, we find that John has a ministry which is to the world. But wait a minute. Over here, James, Cephas, and John, in Galatians 2, Nine, they have a ministry to the circumcision. But wait a minute, John now, he has a ministry to the world. <laughs> Something happened. Hey, wait a minute. This is, not, this is not anything new. Why, we have seen something like this, not quite in the same place. But we've seen something like this with Paul, haven't we? Why, he had a ministry to the Jew first. And then later on, he was then given the revelation of the mystery, and then he had a new ministry. Is it possible that John also has a twofold ministry? I believe so. I believe we are starting to see more light. More light is coming to us as we begin to dig into this study. Are you digging this, friends? John has a twofold ministry. He has a ministry where he was going to the Jew. And we see that in those first ministries of Matthew 22, right? Come to the wedding. Nah, don't want to. Come to the wedding. Yeah, and that involved that second one, Peter and John and James. They're involved with that second one. And then later on what happens is they wouldn't come, they're not worthy, and judgment falls, and the temple is sacked and destroyed, A.D. 70. Bang! John gets this new ministry, which is recorded in John's Gospel. Separate from all the other. Look, oh, everybody knows this, okay? This is not new. Everybody knows that John's Gospel is way different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Right? That's why they call it. That's why they call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptics. Right? Okay. All right. So here's a little summary of it. My little picture. <laughs> so we've been reading Matthew 22, 1 to 6. There's these two ministries. And then here's the one to the highways. Guests, man. Guests. No adoption. No, no. No adoption. Not the bride. No. You are invited as guests. No, no adoption. Just guests. Okay, cool. Now, in John 3, 29, it says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, this is John, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Now, John's talking about this. John the Baptist, he is the friend of the bridegroom. Okay. If you read Revelation 19, 7 and 9, it says this, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. To some degree we see this in weddings today, don't we? We have this pictured in the bride and all. It's a beautiful thing, right? It's all this lovely thing and we hope that what starts off that way will continue through their lives. <laughs> and he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, 
These are the true sayings of God. Notice two things. His wife, that's one. They called unto the marriage. Two. So you have these things given. There is the bride, but there's also the guests, right? John is involved with, with bringing out these guests. Now, the first miracle, remember there's eight miracles. The first one is the wedding at Cana of Galilee. And when the Lord comes, how does he come? Does, do you think he comes as the bridegroom? No. He and his disciples were guests. Now, isn't it interesting that when he comes, he comes as a guest, he fills the water pots, right? They're all full and <clears throat> turns the water to wine and is glorious manifested. And all of these things, the very first miracle that's done is the one to do with the marriage. Right up here, the marriage in Cana, the third day, no wine, glory manifested. Now, if you go through all these things, you'll find that there's a complete symmetry around this central portion. The central portion is showing Jesus as God in the flesh. Feeding the 5,000, walking on the sea. These are things that relate to him as God in the flesh. His power and all his wonder that goes with it. But if you then see the symmetry of these legs, A through C, A through C, what do you see? Well, what you see is in some part uh, things that are happening without completion. For example, look at the noble, nobleman's son after two days at the point of it. He's not dead. He's not dead. But look down at the corresponding one. This has to do with Lazarus. He is dead. One at the point of death, the other one dead. In both cases, what happens? Jesus interposes and glory is, is shown and his power shown and this miracle done. The impotent man, 38 years. What's that about? 38 years relates to Israel's wanderings. Uh, what happens? This, this happens on the Sabbath. The Sabbath becomes an issue about when this miracle was done. Come on down to see what happens. The man born blind, this pool from birth, Sabbath, the sent one comes. Again, the Sabbath. You see, what happens is this shows us the complete power of God in the person of Jesus that everything will be brought to completion that he is relevant today in terms of sin and he's going to complete everything as prophesied in terms of the nation of Israel and bring forth this power completely okay well we can see all sorts of pictures in here but notice the first one the marriage in Cana this shows Jesus as the guest he's not there as the bridegroom when we see this fulfilled, we understand how John's gospel is set up. It's set up showing you that you can come to Jesus, not as the bridegroom, but rather as the one who is the provider of bread in the right season. The Israelites, they took the, the manna. Now you can take the true bread. You can come to Jesus for the resurrection. You can come to Jesus for life. And that starts off right here with this marriage. The other thing is, this one, look at this, John 10, 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Where it says one fold, it's mia poimne, which means one flock. There shall be one flock. So that means that there is this ministry which is going out and bringing in other sheep so that there'll be this one flock. Mm, boy, that's nothing like the, uh, Paul's ministry, is it? Nothing like Paul. Quite different. Paul says this, you see, in Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. See, just like a shepherd. Feed it like a shepherd. Notice flock. Flock. So you can use the word flock in relationship to Gentiles. That church there is mentioned in that context. The bread, our fathers eat manna, right? And then, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now you see the bread, the manna, 
being in the person of Jesus. What am I saying? I'm saying this, and I'll finish with this. So what you have is you have guests to the marriage supper of the Lamb. John's ministry, right? You have other sheep which are not of this fold, not of this outlay. Them I must also bring. Them I must also bring. That's going on today. And then what do you have? Bread for the world. That's John's ministry. Very different to Paul's. Very different to what John had previously. John has a twofold ministry. Cool. It's pretty good, friends. That's my summary of John's gospel. There's a lot of changes in my thinking about this. And there's going to be more coming. Now, we're done with John. Next week, we're going to be begin something different. I haven't decided, but I'll let you know. It'll be good. <laughs> I'll give you some homework to do, like last time. Maybe not as hard a book as John, but still, you'll get some homework. <laughs> let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for today and all that Thou hast taught us in the Gospel of John, Lord, and we thank Thee in His name. Amen.